Psalm 2. Why do the nations rebel and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers conspire together against the Lord and his anointed one. Let us tear off their chains and free ourselves from their restraints. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord ridicules them. And then he speaks to them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. I've consecrated my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will declare the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I'll make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. You'll break them with a rod of iron. You'll shatter them like pottery. So now, kings, be wise. Receive instruction, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverential awe and rejoice with trembling. Pay homage to the sun, or he'll be angry and you'll perish in your rebellion, for his anger may ignite at any moment. All those who take refuge in him are happy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Sin creates fear. Let me say that again. Sin creates fear. Uh, Sin creates fear when you think about it on a personal level, on a community and relational level, on a social and political level. Sin creates fear. Now think back to that first sin, uh, the one described in Genesis 3, which we dealt with back in 2019 in our series on Genesis. As the Lord walks in the cool of the evening in the garden, as the Lord calls for the man and the woman he made in his image when he'd placed them in the garden that he had planted, to whom he'd given good instruction, how did the man respond when the Lord said, Where are you? I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Sin creates fear. Sin creates fear on a personal and relational level because I want to be God, you want to be God, and neither neither of us want God to be God. And that means I make up my rules, you make up your rules, I rule my kingdom, you rule your kingdom, and we know how that pans out, don't we? We know how that pans out. We saw it with Adam and Eve when they had to leave the garden. Their relationship was damaged and fearful because they both wanted to be God. Sin creates fear on a communal and relational level because each community, each society is full of little wannabe gods. And each community wants to define how life should and must be. And then that community works on us and we work on them and we affect each other's desires and aspirations and we compete and we compare and we get fearful and our anxiety rises. Sin creates fear on a social and political level because now each society run by little wannabe gods competes against the other. And you see how the cycle continues? From personal relationship to political relationship. And the end result is very clear. The good life is removed, damaged and warped because sin brings fear. The good life becomes the not so good life. Living the dream becomes enduring the nightmare. It's sugar-coated but we often drown under the fear and competition, comparison and anxiety that this broken world brings. There's only one logical conclusion, reasonable conclusion. If sin brings fear, then we can only have the good life when the sin that causes fear is removed. We can only have the good life when the rule we need replaces the rule we want. In essence, the good life comes when we ask this question, where can I find God and his rule? 
Let me pray, and we're going to look at that in a moment. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Father, it's a really strange time at the moment where a household can't meet together. Uh, we're split up over a number of different locations. Uh, we're gathered in big and little groups on our own or with others. Uh, Father, we recognise the truth that sin causes fear. We recognise that we often live lives driven by competition and conflict and comparison, which can lead to fear and anxiety. Father, please bring us face to face with your King today, the one who removes sin and so removes fear. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, last week we began our series on Psalms by getting our bearings. Remember that? Uh, kind of that image you get when you climb over the top of Caputar and work out where you are. Uh, it's worthwhile doing that again today before we go on any further. Uh, as we deal with this passage, it's worth reminding ourselves that the twin pillars of God's people have always been this, God's word and God's rule. That was a case in the Garden of Eden. It was a case throughout Israel's history. It's still the case today. And last week we saw that the goodness of God's word, his Torah, was the soil for the good life. This week we turn to the other pillar, God's king, God's rule. And we get a connection between those two, God's word and God's king, when God first talks about his king in Deuteronomy chapter 17. Let me read to you from Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 17 to 20. This is a description of what the king is like. When he's seated on his royal throne, he is to write a copy of these instructions for him. He is to write a copy of these and read them in the presence of the priests. Is to remain with him. He is to read from it all the days of his life so that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to observe all the words of his instruction and to do these commands. For God's people, God's word and God's rule go hand in hand. And when they're hand in hand... There's the good life. I want you to remember from last week that God's people have returned from exile. It's the early 500s BC. They'd been kicked out of their land because they decided they knew better than God. And God removed them from the land that he had promised. And now they've come back. But they've come back diminished and disappointed. The borders are smaller. That image of God living with his mob, the temple, is smaller they don't rule themselves and they live as a province of the great Persian superpower. And in that climate, the book of Psalms is compiled. It's put together. It's made up of songs composed across the history of God's people from the time of Moses to that present day. And when God's people put together this songbook for themselves, they're asking themselves these questions. Where's the good life and where is our God? The introduction is Psalms 1 and 2. Last week in Psalm 1, we saw that the good life is found in the Lord's instruction. We saw that Jesus is Psalm 1, that if you're connected to him, you've got the good life. And this week, we look at that other pillar, the rule of God in Psalm 2. Psalm 2 was a common song. It wasn't written for the book of Psalms. It was actually composed a long time before for whenever there was a new king. It was the song sung when that new king was put on his throne. And that new king always came from the family of David. That new king always came from the family of David, just as we read in 2 Samuel 7. So David, his family, and this song become connected. But it's been repurposed like a lot of things at this point in God's people's history to answer their question, where's God? What's he doing? Where's his rule? And looking around at the world, Psalm 2 begins with a very reasonable observation. I'm at point two on the outline. Why do the nations rebel and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers conspire together against the Lord and his anointed one. Let's tear off their chains and free ourselves from their restraint. Do you know what? I've never met a human being who disagrees with that observation. Humans don't want to live with God as God. That's our natural desire. 
We want to be our own gods. I don't want God telling me what to do. I don't want God interfering with my independence. And God's people themselves know that truth. That's why they were in exile, because Persia didn't want God as God. And so they were going to beat up on their neighbours. They are an example of all the nations shaking their fists at God and saying, we're going to do it our way. And the problem for God's people is that they also know their own hearts, don't they? They know that the reason they were taken into exile is because they joined all the other nations. They didn't want God to be their God. And so they suffered the consequences. And as they look around their own society, that realisation works on every level, from households to councils to communities to nations, kings and rulers. Everyone by their nature wants to shake their fist at God and break free to be their own gods. But it's an illusion, isn't it? It doesn't create freedom. It just creates fear. It creates fear on a personal level because others want to be God and your two kingdoms are going to clash, aren't they? Over big things and over little things. It creates fear in society because all your relationships become frayed and damaged, competitive, and you're always comparing your kingdom to the kingdom next door. And it creates fear politically because every little nation wants to be boss. And so as God's people return from that exile, knowing their own hearts, knowing how diminished they are, knowing what all the nations around them are like, they're consumed by fear. You, You read it time and time again through the prophets that speak at that time. They look at the world around them. They fear its fish shaking at God. They fear their own tendencies. Where's God in all of this? Where's his rule in the face of the aggression of others and in the face of my own heart? I reckon most of us have felt that fear at some point, haven't we? Well, let me reassure you. God is where he has always been. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord ridicules them. Then he speaks to them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. I've consecrated my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I'm at point three. I suspect like God's people back then, we lose sight of this reality. God is where he's always been. And he looks at our aspirations to be God and he laughs. He laughs. He looks at our rebellion and our fish shaking and our warmongering and he laughs. Imagine those humans wanting to be God. You see it back in the Tower of Babel, back there in Genesis where humans are aspiring to build this massive tower up to the heavens that's going to dominate the world. And what does God say? I better go down and look at this little tower. That's how significant their rebellion is. I think, and this is a reasonable counterbalance, I think we get so enamoured by God's mercy and grace that we forget his wrath at human sin. We bear God's image. How dare we think we can be God? Our sin is aspirational, but it's never original and it always fails. And when we look at the magnitude of God, we see the smallness of our own aspirations to be God. And God's response is now. Did you notice the tense there in Psalm 2? This is how God responds now. I suspect that when God looks at my efforts to be God every day of the week, he just shakes his head at Bernard and laughs at his stupidity. It's even more stupid when you realise that nothing we have done has derailed God's plans, stopped his designs, 
He's always had his chosen ruler in throne. Did you notice the tense there in verse 6? I've already achieved this. As Ben pointed out, this has always been God's plan. Nothing any human being can do will replace the rule of God. It's an established historical fact. Our sin mocks God and God just looks at it and laughs. But let me tell you, there is reassurance here. As God's people stand in that diminished land, return from exile, they're reminded that God's king is already seated on the throne. No matter how big Persia looks, the nation's rage, even God's people sin, but God's king sits firm. For God's people return from exile with no king, with only a public servant running their rebuilding projects, that's an encouragement. God had promised them a king in 2 Samuel 7 and God said that promise stands firm. It's not moved. It's not revoked. It's not declared null and void. God rules and so does his king. And here is a truth we need to understand. We think we're kings, but God's king is already there. And those two realities will collide at every moment. The mess we live in proves that we'll never succeed at being God. But I guess the question that's posed is, do we actually accept that? Moreover, if our endeavours to be God fail dismally all the time, what kind of king has God put in place? Well, we get a switch there in verse 7, don't we? I'm at point four on the L, and I hope you notice the switch. It moves to first person. I will declare the Lord's decree. He said to me, you're my son. Today I've become your father. Ask of me and I'll make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You'll break them with a rod of iron. You'll shatter them like pottery. We're now getting a soundbite. Don't you love soundbites? Soundbites are great. They really distill everything into a neat understanding. I'm sure you can manipulate them and change them, But that's not the case with God's soundbite, and we get a soundbite from God's king. We get two facts about him. We get the fact of his identity. Did you see it there in verse 7? The king that God has enthroned is who? It's God's son. Just like he said way back there in 2 Samuel 7, God's son is the king, just like he had promised. And we also get the extent of his power. That's the second fact. Did you see that there in verses 8 to 9? The power of this king is granted from God and it has no limit and no rival. There is no viable option that can stand against God's king, nothing. On the one hand, there's a reassurance there. As a small province of the Persian superpower, ruled by Cyrus, who was so far away and so fearsome and fearful. Well, God's king's there, and no one can stand against him. On the other hand, it's a confronting truth, because it confronts the hearts of God's people, who want to be kings, who want to be God, who want to rule themselves. It confronts their own trust as they deal with the world around them. This is the broken world, but know that the king, God's son, is enthroned. And so they've got a decision to make, God's people. They've got a decision to make, and it's a decision mapped out in verses 10 to 12. I'm at point five on the outline. So now, kings, be wise. Receive instruction, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverential awe and rejoice with trembling. Pay homage to the son or he'll be angry and you'll perish in your rebellion. For his anger may ignite at any moment. All those who take refuge in him are happy. So now. So now. There's a decision to be made. A decision that needs to be made based on the facts in front of you. Humans aim to live against God instead of God. That doesn't produce freedom. It just produces fear. God laughs at those attempts because he's already got a king in place. 
God's king is God's son who has unrivaled power and authority. In the face of those four facts, so now, are you with God's king or are you against God's king? Now you can make it a little more personal. Are you going to be your own God and live a life of independence and fear or are you going to know God and live a life of dependence and security? Are you with God's king or are you against God's king? And at the heart of that decision is trust on both sides, in both options. Uh, on the one hand, do you trust yourself to ensure that your life in this world is secure and good? better than what God can offer? Or do you trust God and his king to rule life as he designed it and so live with them in charge? It's a very clear decision, isn't it? So now, as God's people came back to their land, that was the very clear choice in front of them as they compiled the book of Psalms. Did they continue to trust that God was in charge that his promise of a king who would restore the world stood firm and so they had nothing to fear? Or did they give in to the fear-mongering world around them that said, you can do better than God and give in to that false illusion of freedom that comes from rejecting God? Well, some of God's people made the decision to take God at his word. I'm at point six on the outline. And some chose to trust him. We actually meet two of them in Luke's biography of Jesus, don't we? Simeon and Anna, do you remember them? They're described as a man and a woman who were waiting for the consolation of Israel, for God to bring into this world his king, just as he promised. We're told about their first meeting with Jesus, aren't we, if you remember Luke's biography? There when Jesus was just eight days old and they grabbed him and they rocked him And they praised him, didn't they? And they said, he is God's king. Now, I've never done that with an eight-day-old baby. But when you look at the facts of Jesus' life, they'd acknowledged the right king, hadn't they? At his birth, he's identified as from the family line of David. At his baptism... He's identified as the son of God in whom God delights. At the start of his public ministry, when the devil comes to lead him astray, he rejects the devil and the opportunity to break free from God. Throughout his public ministry, there is a public demonstration time and again that there is no power in this world that can rival him. At the high point of his public work there in Matthew's gospel, he's again identified as the son of God to whom we must listen. In his life and in his death, he came to publicly and personally deal with sin and the fear that it brings. In Matthew 11, he invites people to come to him to be made whole. In his death and in his resurrection, he shows that not even death has power over him. And as he ascends into heaven, at the end of Matthew's gospel, he has authority over all things. Now, at at every level, Simeon and Anna recognise the king. Jesus is publicly, consistently, constantly and openly declared in his own life to be the king of Psalm 2. And so after many years of waiting, trusting that God will do as he says, we have the king enthroned who deals with our sin. The good life? Well, last week we learned that Jesus is Psalm 1. He's Psalm 1 for us. To be connected to him is to be connected to the instruction of God in the flesh. This week... We get the other pillar. The man who is Psalm 1 is the king of Psalm 2. Just like God said in Deuteronomy 17, Jesus is God's son who has unrivaled power. To put it simply, the good life is found in Jesus. Jesus. 
the man who is Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, the instruction of the Lord in the flesh and the king who has no rival, not even death. So what does that look like for us as God's people now? What does that look like for us as God's people now? Let me finish with four very simple take-homes. First, God always does what he says. That's the baseline. God made a promise to Samuel 7 and God fulfilled that promise. God does what he promises time and time again. Now the time frame mightn't be to my liking. I work in seconds, not hundreds of years. But God keeps his promise. Secondly, that means that we need have no fear. When I was growing up, there was a surfing label that came on the market. It had, a, had just one phrase. It was called no fear. Everyone was wearing it. I, I suspect people wore it because they thought it would give them no fear, but it, it actually didn't work. Let me reassure you, I experienced fear wearing that label. But we want to live a life with no fear, don't we? Don't we want a life where we don't have to fear anything or be anxious about anything? If we're going to have that life, we've got to deal with that first question or statement that we began the sermon with. We've got to deal with sin because sin brings fear. And we've just seen very briefly that it is God's king enthroned who deals with sin for us. That was Jesus' whole reason, wasn't it? To live, die and rise for our sins. So if we are people connected to him, our sin is dealt with and we need have no fear. We don't need to fear the world's superpowers. We don't need to fear what other nations will do. We don't have to fear what other people will do. We don't have to fear the world we live in because we're connected with the king who death can't even be. So let me encourage you to live with no fear because you're connected to the king of all things and your sin has been dealt with. That leads to the third idea, and it might seem contradictory, but I think it works. Get the right fear. Get the right fear. Did you notice that there in verse 11? Treat Jesus with reverential awe. He's not an exclamation. He's not a space filler in a conversation when you don't know what to say. He's not a swear word. He's not your big brother you put your arm around and punch on the shoulder. He's the king of the universe who's dealt with your sin. So treat him with reverential awe, the right familiarity but also the right honour. And please, and this is the fourth point, please take refuge in him. There are so many options for refuge in this world. Work harder. Create a great family. Enjoy your sport and leisure and take refuge in them. And if none of them work, try some substances. None of them will provide refuge or removal of fear. Only when you actually do business with God and his king will the source of your fear be removed. So let me encourage you, live the good life. Be connected to Jesus, who is God's instruction in the flesh and the king who has beaten our sin. And please take refuge in him. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. We don't often live our lives with songbooks, but this is a great songbook, especially for your people. Father, thank you for Jesus, who is your instruction in the flesh and your king who removes fear. Please help us to remain connected to him. Amen. Any quick questions? Drinder. So for those at the back, Drinders, uh, those at home, Drinders on my left.
Richard's patting her on the shoulder at the moment. Okay, I'm just uh, sharing that with the audience at home. Uh, so uh, let me just get the question. How do I take refuge in God, is that right, when I'm not getting my own way in this world? Yeah, it's, it's a good question because um, often my own way is not necessarily my king's own way. So there's two actual two avenues here. So first is that way where I continue to, to kick against the goads. My king wants me to do this, but I want to do this. And so the way to take refuge in Jesus down that line is to actually bring your rule under his rule, okay, and let him. In the moment. So I think the best way to deal with that is to have built up a habit in the past, which is reading God's word and praying. So that when you come to a moment where you go, my plan's better than God, the fact that you've spent time in God's instruction, Psalm 1, reminds you that it actually isn't. And you actually need to come before God's plan, which is to take refuge in it. I don't have any trouble with God. Yep. It's other people. Yeah, yeah. All right. So that's that's the other line. That's the other line. And so in this other line where you actually have worked out how to submit to God and to submit to Jesus as king perfectly all the time, <laughs> okay, you will then come to two other options. It's then when other people bring to you alternative suggestions that you don't agree with either because of your plans or God's plans, or when society says we're going to do it this way and it rebels against God, okay? So that could be all sorts of other things. So the first option, which is where someone says my plan's better than yours, just return to God's plan time and time again, okay? Come back to God's plan again and again and submit everything to that. In the other line where the world around you says this is the way we're going to do stuff, and you can think of that all the time in society, Okay, can't you? Uh, We've had a number of events like that in the last four or five years in our nation. When it comes to that, you've got to submit to the governing authorities but hold firm to the truth of what Jesus has said. So the key one at the moment, which is becoming a real battleground in our world, uh, are issues of sexuality and gender. God's word's very clear. We submit to that and we make that clear in the public realm And then we submit to the governing authorities when they bring their judgment down upon us. So there's three things that you've got to deal with there, Drinda. Uh, And I've, you know, when that's how that what I've talked through. The heart of answering all of them, of taking refuge in Jesus, is the really simple truth of spend time in God's word and pray. And again, I've used this before uh, time and time again. Karl Barth, great German theologian, asked at New York as he comes off the plane towards the end of his life, what's the greatest truth you've discovered, Karl Barth? What was it? What did he see? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's the most profound truth. Jesus loves me and God tells me that truth in the Bible. Hold those two together and you'll be able to take refuge in Jesus. That's a long-winded answer, Drinda. Terrific. Any other questions? Phil. Uh, So I, I want to be safe eternally, and so I'm just going to hold on to Jesus. Is that right? Yep, yep. So Phil's question. Yeah, so Phil's question is we're in danger here of exchanging our selfish rule with our desire in our selfishness for safety eternally. Uh, you could view it that way. And, and if you do it that way, you've not submitted to Jesus as king. You've just submitted to Jesus as a really good insurance policy. Okay? When you submit to Jesus as king, what does he say he'll do to you? Well, Matthew 11, he'll make you whole, which means he's going to do some really tough woodwork on you. He'll use some really coarse sandpaper at points and some really gentle stuff, but he will transform you if he really is your king. So your selfishness will be changed. It might have driven you to Jesus at the start, but you'll see change over time as you come to reflect him better. So does that answer your question, Phil? Yep. And I think that, that again, ties in with what Drinda was saying. The key way that happens is how? Read your Bibles and pray. Yeah, it's that really that simple. Yeah.